This week at the agenda saw a new premier for the province of Ontario. Planets discovered from the comfort of your desktop and three global elections to watch. The agenda's week in review begins with a look at the teacher's agenda. I coached three sports at various times in my career. So you're, I would coach football in the fall, I would coach basketball in the winter, and I'd coach girls rugby in the spring. I also now open the weight room in the mornings for an hour. Should you be paid for doing that? I, I don't think I should be paid for doing that, but I don't think I should be vilified in the media when I choose Absolutely. not to. If parents have come to, and the government has come to, mm -hmm. expect this as part of a well-rounded, important, citizen-based education, it's a problem when you take it away, even when it's voluntary. Agreed? Absolutely, it's a problem. It's also a problem when you take away people's charter rights. Yes. yes. You, you, yeah. So, I mean, you can't, the, the problem with the government is, in my opinion, is, you, you know, you look at the financial part of it. So the liberals vote the MPPs a raise and then tell teachers that they have to tighten their well, belts. Well, hang on, these MPPs haven't had a raise in six years. Well, so let's That's start. fantastic, but I mean, their salary versus my salary. You look at the raise that Dalton McGinty gave himself, yeah. that equals a, a teacher's salary. So we're, we no, I just said though, Lee, he hasn't had a he hasn't had a raise in six years. But they did. But they did. They did a great big bump. Yeah. What's that? They did a great big bump right before that. So there was a there was a raise that. Well, hang on. You guys aren't going to talk salaries, are you? You no, guys have had good salaries. And, and, no, no, it's not. Exactly. Right. But, but the it's thing about, about it is, is if if you said to me, Lee, I'm going to get you to you have to eat craft dinner tonight because we're really poor. I'm just going to go across the street and have a lobster. That doesn't. But who's really saying that? That's their, their position is that we, the, the province is in dire need of people to tighten their belts. Right. But they're not tightening their own belts. Well, well wait a sec. Uh, so, hang on. I'm missing something here. You got zero. They got zero. How exactly are you eating craft okay. dinner and they're eating lobster? We don't get zero. Can we just start with this? We get minus 1.5 percent. Let's let's get this out of the. Well, the then media they do too. Keeps saying you get zero, but you get then zero, they you get do zero. Too. What do you mean? Because if you're both getting zero, then you're both falling behind. You're, you're talking about inflation. No, right? I'm not talking about talking? inflation. I'm talking about, talking about the fact that they have said in, in lovely McGinty ease, well, we're going to give you three unpaid days. Pardon me, Mr. Ray? Um, that's a pay cut. It's 1.5% of my salary. That's a pay cut. That's not zero. You also took away half of my sick days. That's a pay cut. I don't even want to know what the percentage of that is. So let's get real about the fact that the media and the government keep continually saying teachers are whiners, they want more money, blah, 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 blah. First of all, not only did we agree to 0% back in February of last year, but now we're taking it on the chin and saying, OK, we will take this. Well, you're taking away 1.5% of our salary. And we get it. We understand. But you may not turn me into a villain. You may not say that I am horrible because what I choose to do with my free time is something that I've chosen to put my energy toward fighting the government, who I think is treating us heinously, rather than looking after students who are in my gay straight right, alliance. Right. Catherine, then uh, Adrian. I it, it still somehow it always manages to come back to money. And for myself personally, it is not about that. And even the 1.5% cut, if, if necessary, fine. If it, anything about finances scares me, it's the wording in the Memorandum of Understanding, which states that the PDT will review PDT? the provincial discussion table, okay. the, the bankruptcy lawyers, even after this imposed contract is finished, will be reviewing the qualifications and salary grids where applicable and we'll change it with a view to future sustainability. Right. It's a great big question mark hanging over our heads, and I'm okay with things if to do my part for the economy with the way things are right now, but wording like that terrifies me. Adrian. Um, I, I'd agree with that. There is, there is a longer term thing of what's going to happen in 2014, but in the meantime, the extracurriculars, I think the reason, my understanding is the reason those have, have, uh, have been used as um, an issue by the unions in this is because we haven't been given any other There's choice. No other well, the the, uh, the government's position means that um, there was no flexibility in the negotiation when they came to us and now they've imposed Bill 115, we are not allowed to, to appeal the bill or take any form of any other action. So tell me this and then, if, yeah. if, if I hear what you're saying yeah. and teachers have, if teachers feel their rights are being infringed upon, they have to respond the way they have to respond. Mm -hmm. How does it look 
when we learn that your unions are telling you, if you provide those extracurriculars, we're going to fine you 500 bucks. That's no, 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 none of us. I, I, I haven't certainly seen that. I don't believe that. No, 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 they're not allowed to do that. Yeah. What's we're, 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 we're not in a legal strike position, so they can't impose anything against. Yeah. Yeah. Walk into so they can, they can ask in a voluntary sense, but they can't. They can't say you must. They can say we would like you to, and they can phrase that however they like. But it's a yes. we would like you to, and if it's a if it's a we would like you to, then there cannot be any penalty for that. The only wording I ever saw was we invite you to think yes. about how you want to spend yes. your voluntary time. Yeah, and if you're and a teacher, can who, I can I just I mean, finish though? Yeah. I. I, most teachers volunteer to do things that they love to do. And the, okay, the things that I volunteer to do, I would very much like to get back to doing. But unfortunately, that's not an option right now because this is literally the only recourse that I have. And I would really like that when my children grow up, they still get to live in a democracy. And small things, big things start very small. And I, compl I completely agree with that. But that brings me back to one of my main ideas. It's about, the whole thing is about optics. It's been so easy for the government to vilify us in the, in the mainstream media. I don't feel that the way we've been presented accurately reflects what I, what, not just what I see around this table, but what I see in the staff room, what I see at my union Where's meetings. Where's it off? Pardon? Where's it off? Yeah. Um, by calling it a wage freeze. By calling it a wage freeze. I, I, think, I think some of that is about is about, and again, I'm, I'm sure I'm saying something that is going to get me into all kinds of trouble for this, but I'm not the only one who feels it. Um, I think it's about the way that our, our union has chosen to represent us. I often feel that they've used, uh, that they've used a, 20th century, a 20th century approach to fight a 21st century media war. And, and hey, I'm the union steward for my school. I will do whatever the union tells me. I will get the union members at my school to do exactly what the union asked them to do. But just because I'm, a, um, to use this analogy, a foot soldier in, soldier in the trenches, you can believe in the war, but you don't necessarily have to agree with the strategy that the generals are taking about going over the next okay, particular here, hill. Here's the conventional wisdom. Yes. Uh, people love their doctors. They don't necessarily love the Ontario Medical Association. Right. People love their teachers. They don't necessarily like the Ontario Secondary School Teachers Federation. Right. Is that what we've got going on here? Um, I'm feeling some of that. It's a, this is exp again, this is my personal expression, um, but I'm not alone in feeling that we haven't sold it. I, I very much feel that the... Um, the union needs to approach this issue as if we're marketing ourselves, not to each other, because most, most of the people I speak to believe in the cause, but market ourselves to the public. Joining us now for more, Matthew Fisher, international affairs columnist for Post Media News and Canada's longest serving foreign affairs correspondent. We're always happy to welcome you back Thanks to our studio. Thank you for having me, Steve. Thanks for being here. Well, let's start with Asia, because you've been all over lately. The Obama administration has announced what it's calling a bit of a pivot towards Asia, and they announced that about a year ago. What, what does that pivot mean, as far as you know? Well, it means an awful lot, and I think it has not yet registered really with Canadians how much it means. We, we still, whether you're a newspaper uh, or a journalist or a member of the public or a politician, we're still more Eurocentric, I think, than we should be. So much is going on there. A lot of it is because of China, obviously. Uh, it's also because of India. and. Uh, uh, this started before Obama. Obama announced it about a year ago, but the shift actually began a few years earlier, I think, and would have been more profound, except that the wars in the Middle East slowed the process down a bit, but now it's start, uh, starting again with a vengeance. But a pivot from what to what? No longer is the Middle East the center of so much American attention. That's what it looks like going forward, and certainly Europe isn't really on the list anymore in the way it used to be. It just it just isn't and won't be, I don't think. Uh, in terms of substance, it's about moving ships, moving hardware, and if you look at a map, it's about hemming in China. That's what China certainly thinks. Uh, there's an interesting dynamic there, because in the Middle East, we're used to the United States being the bogeyman. It's hated everywhere. It's reviled. Uh, in Asia, this was the idea during the Vietnam War, but they love America now. And they love America not really, of course, because they love America. They love America because they don't like China. And China now has enemies absolutely everywhere. South Korea is at odds with them. So is Japan, the Philippines, Malaysia, Brunei. 
uh, Indonesia, Vietnam. Uh, Burma is a very friendly to China, but its people are not. Its government has been, mm -hmm. but the people have deep reservations. Only Cambodia, uh, th that's really China's only friend there. And everyone, the politicians and the public, they're asking the United States to come back. And I saw this when I was in Australia last year in, Dar uh, in Darwin in the north. The United States Marine Corps has established a base there, and about 3,000 Marines are based there permanently, but they don't say they're there permanently because they all rotate through. They don't bring their wives and kids, and this allows them to say it's really a temporary base, but it is not a temporary base a at plausible all. Deniability. Um, plausible deniability. Well, let's pivot towards the Middle East because I want to see what you ha have to think about the Arab Spring and what has taken place in places like Egypt and Tunisia and Libya. Generally speaking, do you think, do you think the arrow of history is pointed in the right direction in those countries? No, but I think it's inevitable the direction that it is pointed in. I, I should say that I've been to many Middle Eastern countries lately, but I've not been to Libya or Tunisia, but I've spent quite a bit of time in Egypt. And when the United States and others advocate for uh, democracy, you have to be careful of what you wish for. Mm -hmm. And the democracy that is evolving there and what will happen in Syria God forbid, uh, will be very strongly Islamist in a way that is probably unfriendly to Western interests. In which case, is America's interests, or excuse me, America's influence in the Middle East, do you think, growing, declining, staying the same, what? Declining very rapidly. Nobody, they still want American money. Egypt depends on American money for everything. That is why they, I believe they still have a relationship with the United States. But that's the only thing holding them back. What is happening is the U.S. is going to need less of the energy in the Middle East. Hmm. And China is going to need more. Well, that in itself suggests a tilt. There's also a thing which I think Western journalists have not been truthful to Western audiences about the revolutions, particularly the Egyptian one. You recall all the scenes in Tahrir Square, and they interviewed all these beautifully eloquent young people speaking fabulous English, many of them young women, about our revolution. I, I saw a report here uh, over Christmas in Canada in which she said we went and talked to an average Egyptian person, and she spoke uh, beautiful American English, and she said, uh, they will not take our revolution away from us. Well, her revolution has already been taken away from her. It's done. By the Islamists. Uh, by the Islamists. They've won now five different votes. It's four or five uh, different votes. And they're getting about 70% of, the, uh, of the vote collectively, the radical Islamists, the ones that are less extreme, whatnot. Uh, and the people who think like we do, if you like, uh, uh, are clearly in a minority. And we go again and again so often as journalists, not only in Egypt, to, but to speak to people who are educated in the West and who speak like us. And then we tell our publics that this is representative of the country. And well, it's, it's a, huge mistake, hmm. a huge mistake. Of all of the things that we've talked about today, would you venture to speculate as to what will dominate our foreign affairs interests in 2013? Well, I'll tell you, the biggest story is going to be the royal baby. <laughs> uh, okay, more serious. No, uh, no, the, but, but I'm, I'm serious about I mean, the way no, I, the media thinks. I'm sure it will. But. And Nelson Mandela's health will mm -hmm. be the other great concern. But in terms of shifts, I think what we're con going to continue to see is that Asia is rising and there will be more um, friction in Asia and slowly but surely the rest of the world will be drawn into this uh, because we have interests. Of course there are other big things going on. One is will Europe continue to recover a bit economically? Uh, another one is will uh, uh, terrorists, will Islamists make further inroads uh, in Africa? And of course there's always the Middle East and there's the Iranian question and Syria. When Syria blows, whenever it falls apart, God help us, because we've seen nothing yet, I think, in terms of the violence that is likely there. And who can predict how it will end up, except I do think it will not end up very well for our interests at all, or the interests of our friends over there. Uh, 
Iran, well, it's a, it's a very interesting question because most Israelis or a majority of Israelis don't want military action. Neither do their military leaders, but their government seems to want this. Uh, the American uh, senior military leadership is completely opposed to this, but the Obama government is giving mixed signals on this, and we all know what the Republicans would like them to do. And of course, we know that the Canadian government is all for action, although we will have no part of it, but we're all for somebody doing something, even if it's not us. All of those things uh, w will be in play in 2013, but uh, it's a mugs game to predict what will be number one or number two or when things might happen. But China is rising, and we don't have to fear China. We don't have to go to bed at night and worry uh, about China and what horrible things it's going to do to us. It's nothing like that. But we have to really start to figure out an Asian policy that is beyond sending a trade minister, who's a, a very interesting fellow, Ed Fast, who goes on these uh, big missions, and he has had some successes. But our policy must be a lot deeper than that and a lot more involved than just having a minister out there waving the flag and saying, we're open, take our natural resources. Astronomy, in some sense, has been crowdsourcing for centuries. We've relied on amateurs to scan the skies for us. This is slightly different. With websites like Zooniverse that you've got up there, um, we are taking the data that we as professionals collect, putting it on the web, and creating interfaces that allow anyone to sort through. So what you're looking at here is data from a NASA telescope called Kepler that tells you about the brightness of a star. And what you're looking for here is the blink that happens when a planet gets in front of that star, just like you can see here. And if you can see one of those dips, well, congratulations, you just found a planet around another star. Hmm. Okay, given that there are, I think, nearly 800,000 people or so who are contributing to things like planet hunters, and they are amateurs, what happens if they get it wrong? They look at the data, they say, oh, there's a planet there, but in fact, they've got it wrong. Well, the first thing is that they shouldn't worry about that. Um, this is science, but it's not scary. So the first thing we do is we have lots of people look at each image or each piece of data. And then collectively, it means we don't make silly mistakes. After all, if, if I had one student look through all of this data, they'd fall asleep, they'd get bored, they'd go and get coffee, they'd hit the wrong button. If we have lots of people working together, that doesn't happen. We can then take that data and check it against what computers tell us. We can check it against ground truth. And so, for example, with Planet Hunters, we check that we find the planets that other people have got, but we've also discovered that we find a few extra ones. And those extra ones are real planets going around other stars that have slipped through the net, that have been uh, missed by computers, missed by professional astronomers. Uh, and we know they're real because we know we've got a good track record at detecting all these other planets. I think if you think about it, the first planet around another star was only discovered back in 1995, so it wasn't that long ago. And we're now at the point where just by using a web browser, you can make a really spectacular discovery. Hmm. Okay, Rapinder, let me get you into this now. And let's just, before I ask you a question, remind everybody who may recognize you because you were the 2010 Best Lecturer Competition winner uh, for something called Exoplanets, the Search for Other Earths. Uh, and I wonder whether you imagined at the time that you were involved in that, that you would be actually getting your students involved in this kind of a search. Uh, no, I, at that time, I, I didn't even realize that uh, Zooniverse and Planet Hunters were around. This was actually at the instigation of one of my students. So I had uh, a student, Kyle Bailey, who was doing a fourth year undergraduate thesis project. And he was doing a theoretical project. But what he did was stumble upon this planethunters.org website. And he found it fantastically engaging. Uh, educational and, and really, really useful in sort of comparing his uh, theoretical work that he was doing trying to model these planets uh, moving around these stars versus the real data, being able to compare what, uh, what actually happens that takes into account things that his models can't, like in measurement error, instrumentation error, or the variation in star activity, the brightness of the star itself. And you've got more students, I presume, working on this now? Uh, exactly, exactly. So right now I have another undergraduate student, Nadia Jessu, and she's doing a observational project where she hopes in the long term to be able to uh, create software that, that does a better job than what we exists currently. And, and to be able to do that, you've got to understand 
uh, exactly what these planets look like and, and what they do to uh, the light coming from these stars. And so her experience, not just using the, the software, not just uh, going through the data, but actually engaging with the community. One of the most fantastic parts of these uh, websites is the huge community of, of amateurs that, that develops around it. And they, they basically help each other to, to, to learn. And, and it's, it's a back and forth that goes on through these um, discussion boards, uh, Facebook posts, blogs, everything uh, culminates in, in basically more science being done by, by the collective. It's incredible. Well, let me follow up with Chris on that, because I gather one of the, um, if you think about the Planet Hunter site, I gather one of the aspects of the magic, if you like, of all of this is that hunters can discuss with other hunters uh, what they may believe to be a planet. And I wonder how this feature sort of changes the experience for all of those who are involved in it. Well, I think it makes it more, it makes it more interesting. It's nice to have some company if you're going to explore strange new worlds. Um, but from our point of view as a science team, one of the things it does is it allows us to make really serendipitous discoveries. It allows us to find the truly unusual stuff. The main site tells you, asks you simple questions that anyone can answer that help us find your run-of-the-mill planets. But with Planet Hunters, we found some very, very unusual things. For example, we found the first planet in a four-star system, so a planet with four suns in its sky. Um, now, that looked rather unusual on the site, and we found it because we saw that people were talking about it. And some of the expert users were able to help us understand what was going on because they could see that people were talking about it. So we actually, these days, listen in not, not only on people's work on the site, but we also uh, take part in the community and listen to the chatter. And sometimes you make a spectacular scientific discovery uh, by listening to essentially the coffee house gossip, which is rather fun. Doug Smith lived the dream that so many young Canadian kids have. He was a first-round draft choice and played in the National Hockey League. But 20 years ago, Smith went headfirst into the boards while playing hockey in Europe. The collision shattered his neck, leaving him paralyzed. His hockey career was over, and he wasn't even 30 years old yet. Now Doug Smith is an accomplished author, motivational speaker, and national spokesperson for the Brain Injury Association of Canada, and he joins us now here in our studio, and it's great to see you again. Thank you. Thank and you just, for having me. Let's set the record straight. You're okay now, right? Yeah, I have sporadic numbness from the chest down, but I've managed to learn how to use everything again. Doug, you walked into the studio. Yes, yes, I'm walking. Every morning I get up and my feet hit the ground, I'm a, I'm a happy guy. You're a happy guy. Let's just get some of your background on the record here. Born in Ottawa, uh, first round draft choice of the LA Kings in 1981. Second overall, yeah. Second overall. That's yeah. pretty good. Played for Kings, the Oilers, Buffalo Sabres, Sabres, Penguins. And for Pat Quinn in Vancouver when Nick Trevor Quinn. Linden was there. Right. Did you ever play, did you play with Gretzky? Never did. We were always against each other. I probably played 50, 60 games against him head to head. Against him? Yeah. How was somebody that? had to somebody had to keep him honest, right? I held him to two, what, 2000 points? <laughs> nice job. <laughs> nice job. I'm glad you've got a sense of humor about it. Uh, I want you cuz we're going to we're going to hit this right right off the top here. We've got a clip of your accident 20 years ago that we're going to show, but I want you to set it up for us before we show the clip. You're playing hockey at this point in Europe, is that right? Yes, yes, I had left the Pittsburgh Penguins and gone over to play in the Alpine League over in Austria. You were playing in Austria. Mm -hmm. What position? Centerman. You're going into the other team's end. Dump and chase, everybody knows what a dump and chase is. Done it 10,000 times and uh, that's what it was. And I just, uh, calamity of circumstances, I went top of the head first into the end boards, full speed. How old were you? 29 years old, February 7th, 1992. As soon as you hit those boards, do you remember what you thought? Yeah, I knew my back was broken. I knew, I knew something had happened. It was like a lightning bolt going off inside my body. And uh, I knew I couldn't move. I was conscious. I was very fortunate to be conscious. I was wearing the best helmet at the time. And uh, I laid on the ice and uh, I asked for help. I don't know who I was asking for help, but I, I asked for help very quietly to myself. And uh, help came and I told them I had broken my back. And um, they were very careful with me. And, for the next uh, year, I spent uh, most of that time in a hospital bed. Okay, you ready to look at this again? Yeah, yeah, let's do it. Roll tape, please. That's you. So the defenseman uh, slammed on the brakes and like sliding into third base, uh, he, uh, his skates gave out, the ice gave out, and he lifted me up at the hips and I couldn't get my hands up quick enough. So 
Um, my uh, spine was what brought me to a dead stop. The force, we've done the force calculations and it's equal to accelerating from zero to 100 kilometers an hour in a third of a second. That's how fast I decelerated. Mm. And the, the whole impact was on my spine. I was fortunate I went top of the head first in. If I wouldn't have, I might have, I might have snapped my neck to the side. So the whole spine took the brunt. It's amazing what the body can, uh, can sustain. Do you blame that other guy for what happened to you? No, no, I'm so thankful that nobody hit me. I'm so thankful that nobody hit me. It was hard enough for me. I, I can't imagine having, I've been in situations where I've hit guys on the ice and they haven't gotten up. And um, when you're in the game, you don't think about it that much. But today, it'd be something that would haunt me. Now, while you were lying there on the ice, did you say to yourself, I'm never going to walk again. I can tell. I've got that feeling. I can't move. I'm never going to walk again. My whole focus was not moving so that I could stay alive. Um, I, I was more concerned for my life than anything else. And getting pictures. I, I knew that we needed to get pictures. And so getting to the hospital and getting x-rays and, and getting all that done was, was the crucial part for me. Now, I wasn't paralyzed when I was on the ice. Um, paralysis happened months later when uh, they opened me up and everything fell apart. My neck was broken in 200 places and uh, all the ligaments in the back of my neck were torn. So the chances of me having to go into surgery and have things corrected were very high and uh, it was in surgery that I was paralyzed. Did you have surgery over there? I had surgery here in North America. Here? Yeah. So they f somehow flew you back here to have surgery? Yeah, I flew back in traction. I was transported around. Uh, if you go to my website, you'll see the pictures of me being transported around the world by helicopter, by plane, uh, and came back to Ottawa and, and moved into the Ottawa Rehabilitation Center. And spent how, a year recovering? Yeah, it was about a year in a hospital bed. Uh, when I had uh, the spinal cord injury, I had complete neural shutdown. So I lost uh, bladder, bowels, arms, legs. I couldn't feed myself. And, mm. and uh, family surrounded me. They built an environment around me and protected me like I had been protected as a child. And when you were in the midst of all of that, did you think, this is my new normal in life? <sighs> all, all I could think was, was that I, I didn't want to live anymore for the, for the first weeks of, of being paralyzed. And I haven't met anybody since uh, that has had a spinal cord injury that didn't want to take their own life because of the adjustment. The adjustment is so great. And uh, one day I got a little spark in my left toe and uh, it spread like a web uh, over about six or eight months and went from a walker to, uh, to a cane and then started to put weight back on. I had atrophied already. already. I had atrophied down to about 150 pounds. I saw that picture of you on your website. You were a skinny little guy after you uh, got uh, finished. When I, when I was getting back on my feet again, yeah. yeah, my legs could hardly hold me. I just want to start by just playing back some of the interview that I did with Kathleen Wynne after her victory at Maple Leaf Gardens at the weekend. So let's roll that tape, then we'll come back and chat. The job ahead. Yes. Who's your first phone call to tomorrow? Well, actually, I just had a conversation with Tim Hudak. He, Already? He reached out. Yes, he called. And uh, I had said I was going to call both Tim and uh, Andrew Horvath tomorrow. But Tim already called me, and we we're going to try to get together on Monday. He's around on Monday. Was it anything more than kind of congrats, courtesy call, that type of thing? Well, we both agreed that uh, he and I actually, <laughs> Tim has lived in the neighborhood that I live in for in North Toronto for huh. a while. So every now and then when I'm running, I'll see him out walking his dog. When, so now, when you say running, you don't mean for office. You mean actually, I mean actually with jogging, your legs. Yeah, jogging, yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, so we've had you know we've had casual interactions, and you know we acknowledge that we both have had good conversations in the past. So who knows? We are uh, we will have a conversation on Monday, and I hope to talk to Andrew Horvath either tonight or tomorrow. She spoke to Tim Hudak Saturday night at the convention. In fact, just before she did the interview with us. She spoke to Andrea Horvath earlier today. The progressive conservatives are already running attack ads against her, saying that she is just another overspending McGinty type. The NDP have thrown down a gauntlet of their own, saying that if you want minority parliament to work, let's have a public inquiry on the whole gas plant cancellation issue. <coughs> so that's where we are at the moment. This is day one of the incoming premier's new role as Liberal Party leader. And there's an attack ad out already. Um, so much for a honeymoon, eh? Welcome to the NFL. This is the way <laughs> politics works. Uh, I think that to Judith's point, of all of the candidates, Kathleen is the one that is most likely to make a minority parliament work for a while. I think she's, she has that effect and is, is willing to listen. Uh, by the same token, while people don't want an election, do they want another year of the kind of legislature that we had? 
in, in Ontario where very little got done. Uh, there was a lot of rancor, a lot of unpleasant things happening. So I, I think if uh, of the candidates, the one that can make a minority parliament work, it's uh, Kathleen Wynne. I think she has that ability. Uh, but all that baggage comes along with her, both hers and the entire parties. Uh, so this is the way politics is done in the modern age. Um, you, you might like to think it would be nicer, but uh, it really isn't. Let me get Howard, because I want you to hear what everybody has to say, yeah, then I'll yeah. give you a chance to, to uh, Andrea Horvath at her news conference today, your successor, Andrea yeah. Horvath, she, um, she basically said, Kathleen Wynne, if you want this legislature to work, then let's take the whole gas plant issue out of the legislative contempt place, let's kick it over to a public inquiry, let's have it report in six months, which if there's a fall election would come just on the, <laughs> you know, on the eve of that election. W was that helpful? Uh, well, look. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> whether something is whether something is helpful or not, I I don't think uh, you know you can debate that. Uh, I don't think it's going to get you anywhere. You're, you're going to see a, a, a lot of positioning things. All right, for Andrea Horvath in the NDP, I think there is a sincere desire to work with the new premier. I think there is, but if you don't have a place to put, you know, these electricity issues for a while they're going to be the topic of question period and they're going to be the topic of committees and they're just going to keep coming up and coming up and coming up and it will be it will be right back to the you blew the money uh, you made a bad deal uh, you've uh, let down the the rate payers of ontario so every every day in question period so good. so i think there's a there's a constructive yeah. attempt here there's a constructive mm. attempt to say look don't have this as the fodder every day for question period Send it off to a royal commission. And that depoliticizes it? No, no, but look, I mean, here's the magic of royal commission. Somebody gets up and says, I want to talk about the gas plant. And the answer is, we're going to hear from the commission in six months. Just before a potential fall election. Well, it may be. Again, that depoliticizes it? It may be before a potential fall election. You don't know that. No, I don't. But if, if you, yeah. that's the choice, I think one of the choices the new premier has. If you want this as the fodder for question period every day, and in question in, in committees every day, then don't set up a commission. Okay, table, but if you if, want if, it off the table for a while, do you think there's then a, do a commission? Do you think there's a snowball's chance in hell she'll call uh, a, a, what, a public inquiry into this gas plant thing? Well, my advice would be not on your life um, uh, for a couple of reasons. One of which is my experience has been that a a public inquiry, uh, it, it actually doesn't stop the opposition from asking questions, just gives the government a different answer. That's all it does. But so, you know, as Martin said, the <laughs> we elect MPs to do something. We've got 60,000 pages of documents that have been dumped on them in a public forum. They actually demanded the decision. The hypocrisy of this is a little stunning, but, you know, as I say, it's the NFL. As for the attack ads, I could not be happier because the, 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 the idea that I think Ontarians carry of Tim Hudak in their head is this kind of mean-spirited, old-style, hack-and-slash, uh, Harris-type Tory who, who hadn't quite grown up to someone who could run the province, and he's reinforcing that image with attack ads right out of the gate. Instead of someone to come to the table and say, I'm prepared to work together, let's, let's bring some statesman-like well, skills. He and did he, call her. He, he was the first one to call her on Saturday night. He called her in private and attacked her in public. I'm talking about his public behavior. His public behavior speak. I mean, frankly, one of the problems with Tim Hudak, some of the people who met him on, on privately say, geez, he's not the kind of guy I see in person because he continues to behave in public like someone who's not ready for prime time. And that is the Agenda's Week in Review. And you can see all of those programs in their entirety on our website. That's theagenda.tvo.org, on our iTunes channel, or on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash theagenda. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.